What's going on, Journey people? Today, I have a good brother of mine, Darren Casper. He's been involved with the church on a micro level and a macro level, that he's a church planner, he's a pastor, but he's also instrumental in seeing churches planted throughout our city. So I'm just glad that you're uh, yeah. with us, uh, Darren. Uh, when it comes to the church, what do you see God calling you to be a part of in St. Louis? Mm -hmm. I may have told you this before, Curtis, but a few years back, uh, Kelly and I really felt like God was calling us overseas to career mission work. And oddly enough, strangely enough, in a hotel room in Cairo, Egypt, got a, just a sense from the Lord that was, Darren, you're to come back home and mm -hmm. you're going to be in St. Louis. St. Louis is your city. It's your place. And you're to come back home and be a connector. And so, you know, for the last 10, 15 years, that's really what it's been. It's been about helping to connect people with different kingdom ministry opportunities, you know, across this great city. If I ask you, man, why does the church exist? What would you, what would you say? Yeah. Well, you know, when, when the people of God gather together corporately, whether it's in a, you know, in a living room or it's in a large space, like maybe what happens here at The Journey, there's something powerful that happens just for that individual follower of Jesus and what they experience yeah. as they come together. But also, and I think very significantly, is that we connect with the heart of God for people. Yeah. We connect with, not only are we experiencing all of the joys and the benefits of what it means to follow Jesus, but we're connecting with God's heart for people who don't know Him yeah. yet. Yeah. And there's nothing more exciting or meaningful, I, I know in my life, and I'm sure your life as well, is when we connect with God's heart for the world. Well, good morning, good morning. For those who are new here, my name is Curtis, and I'm the preaching pastor here. And before we dive into God's word, let's bow our heads and ask God to bless his word. Lord God, we, we love you. Um, we need you. We thank you that you would see fit to order our steps to be in this place, to gather with your children, your people, to hear your word, to, to sing your praise. What a privilege, what a blessing. God, my prayer is that we would all experience the unique touch, your unique manifested presence, that we would hear your voice, whether it's a whisper or a shout that's calling us to life and to light and to restoration, and to healing, and to redemption. And God, we pray, Lord God, that you would so build in us the, the reality of being your gathered people so that the world will be made better to your glory. So in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the privileges uh, that I have as a father in raising my two boys is uh, to teach them that and when they leave uh, my presence, the presence of their mother, that they are going into the world representing something far bigger than themselves. That as they are learning math and playing kickball and, and, and playing Beyblades with their homies, that they, that, they, that they need to be marked with something, some activity, some postures um, that shows the world that they are a Gilbert. Uh, they don't have the privilege of going about their life like they're just simply Caden or Chase, but they're representing something, and they are the visible expressions of that bigger story. Now, many of their friends will not interact with their parents, but through them, they should know the, the Gilbert story, the, the reality that you are part of something bigger. And one of the things that we do, I may have shared this uh, in the past, but uh, we do the Golly Gilbert mantra. When I take my son's school, and there are some things that I have him repeat just to remind him this is how you are entering into this world. And so I would start godly Gilbert men. We love Jesus. We serve others. We protect girls. We work hard. And we love learning. And then we have another one that we just add in once in a while just to remind us that we are Gilbert men from Birmingham, Alabama. We say that we eat ribs and chicken. That's important. We are not vegetarians. We don't eat grass and, and leaves. That's not what we do in the Golly Gilbert household. And I do that regularly so that uh, knowing that they're not going to always be that, but I want to get it in their rhythm that there are things that you, your life should be touched with. Regardless of what activity you're doing, it should be touched with a, a way of, of loving Jesus and serving others. Because you're a visible expression of something far bigger than you. And likewise, as we looked at last week, that, that God crafted a people, a universal people, 
But theologians also call an invisible people, a people that are crafted in eternity, loved, set apart, called out, and sent for the glory of God and the good of the world. And we looked what we call the narrative arc of these people from Genesis to Revelation. What is the journey that these people are on? But God never saw fit. He never desired for these people to simply be abstract, but that he means for the invisible people to be visible, from the universal people to be local, for them to be able to gather He means for the church to have hands and and feet and a voice so that when the world interacts with them, they they interact in a particular way that shows them these people are part of something far bigger than themselves. And this is what we're looking at today is, man, what are are the characteristics? um, What is the purpose of gathering and being in the local church? What should this visible expression, what should the hands and feet feel like when we are this local expression, when the, the invisible church lands at a specific place, at a specific time, and function with a specific people. So we're going to do so looking at the book of Acts. It's a movement in the birth of the church. When that's when we begin to see the visible expression of the local church moving about through the world. And we will look at Acts 11, a profound church, the Antioch church that was a history-altering church, that through this church, the gospel moved throughout the civilized world and to the end of the world. It's through this church that marks a multicultural church. It, it leaves some, some markings and some uh, uh, visible expression that we all should long for and want, and I pray that we become. For It, it shows us why a local church should, should be active and should be even in existence. So what do we see? in the Antioch church. First thing that we see and why we gather is that the local church perseveres. It is a people of perseverance. It's important that the the Christian is is one marked to not simply start well, but to finish well. And has been given the, the empowering presence of the Spirit and a community called the church to help you become that. We see that in this, this Antioch church for, for we see really quick how this church started. And we see at the end of verse 20, it started because some came preaching the Lord Jesus. Now that's interesting. They're coming because if you look at verse 19, now those who were scattered because of the persecution, they're coming out of the persecution. Now, let me remind you, if you do not know, let me teach you that this persecution came from Stephen. Stephen, one of, the, uh, one of the members of the church, speaks a prolific sermon, angers them so about what he is confessing and testifying of Jesus, that he is killed because of the Lord Jesus. And upon his death, persecution breaks out. Saul, Saul ravages the church. Stephen is killed because of the Lord Jesus, but they are coming preaching the Lord Jesus. For because the, the church, the Christians, Though persecution came and scattered them because it was meant to, it never stopped them. At a moment when you would think it would re- they would cause them to rethink their position with this Lord Jesus, they recommitted their commitment to this Lord Jesus. They take this message on to Antioch, and from that moment and sharing and living, the church is birthed. And all of a sudden, we see persecution and pain moving the church about. Never, never forget that though, the, though Satan might be a roaring lion, though he might look fierce, though he might be active at times, he never can thwart the plans and purposes of God. For we see in this that God remains sovereign and that though Satan saw fit to destroy the church through the death of Stephen, it's the death of Stephen that God used to advance the purposes of God. When your life is encountering pain, and suffering, and persecution, and loss, and being marginalized, never be convinced that the Satan has the last word. Never be convinced that your pain has the last word. God has the unique ability of taking that, putting it in his hands, and advancing his purposes in you and through you. We see that the purposes of God, through their pain and persecution, birthed a church, started a church. Your pain may not start a church, but it may They start a conversation. People may look upon the peace and joy that you have in walking through what you're walking through, and they would lean in because you are walking with it with a unique 
posture that points to your God. Embrace the pain, whatever he calls you to walk through, because he's always writing a bigger story, and he'll use your pain to bring it to fruition. Uh, the Antioch church was faithful, not just in this moment, and not just preaching, but faithful through time. For what we see with this church, it didn't just start strong, but it perpetuated, it continued in their faithfulness. In the book of Acts, in the New Testament, yes, but even beyond the book. Like it's in Antioch that we get, that we get such, such fruit coming out of that, that, that the church worldwide is benefited. Like we get some of the most profound members of the church, Simeon the Elder, we get the prolific Antioch Bible School. We, we get Ignatius, one of the early church fathers who so persevered, who so was faithful to the Lord Jesus that, that when they put him in a coliseum to be eaten by lions and a lion was roaring to him, the leading lion with his mouth wide open, coming to close and in his life, it was then that we heard him scream, now I become a Christian. Because the Christians are one who persevere, who finish strong. The church is a persevering one, a faithful one, despite what we may see, despite what we may experience. And let us not be foolish to think that that kind of persecution just happened back then. Let us not sit in our comfort and think, because, what our, because our lives look with ease, that church must, must be experienced in this world. Why? It is not. For we are no doubt still a persecuted church. Adam, part of our mobilization team, just sent me some information on the persecuted church, and the first line just convicted me, brought me to repentance, because so often I will speak of the persecuted church as the church over there, separate from me, but may this quote just settle on your heart. There is no persecuted church or free church. There is only the church. And when one part suffers, we all suffer. So there are persecuted Christians worldwide. And this is what our brothers and sisters are experiencing, and we grieve and suffer along with them. Every month, 105 churches are vandalized, attacked, or destroyed. In the 50 most dangerous countries, it's estimated that over 245 million brothers and sisters are suffering from high levels of persecution. Within one year, a little over 4,000 brothers and sisters gave their life because of their love for Jesus. Whether well, it's persecution, pain, or suffering, the, the Christian, the church is marked with perseverance. And we are called to encourage you, equip you to that end, that you finish strong, that you persevere, and you walk through anything the Lord allows you to walk through. On the backside of perseverance, often happens, and we see this, this theme throughout scriptures that when pain and persecution happens, it brings about growth. We saw it in Exodus, and we're seeing it now that persecution brought forth the church. And all of a sudden, when the preaching from the persecution happens, verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The local church grows, it grows, it grows numerically. It grows spiritually. We see that the many who came, they weren't just simply celebrating the conversion, but, but entered into discipleship and development. For we will continue to see that Barnabas from Jerusalem came because he heard about faith in these people. He came and he saw the grace of God on their lives and was glad, encouraging them. You would see that in verse 23. And this Barnabas continue to encourage and love them, and then goes and gets Saul to come and disciple them and grow them because the church, when the gospel is preached, lived, shared, listened to, it bears fruit. It's not dead. It's not stagnant. Like this gospel, the reality that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, in your place, was buried, got up and walked out of the tomb, securing those who believe him in eternity so that those who come to him 
repent of their sins, take his righteousness upon themselves, perfection standing in front of the holy God. That is good news. And when that's preached and when that's shared, it bears fruit. It never stays stagnant. Like it grows in salvation. Like, like sometimes we can get used to the gospel and forget that it still has the ability of saving radical, wicked, faraway hearts. It still has the ability to reach into the, to the lives, the soul of any human being and call it to life. The lead pastors were hanging out, Pastor Jason from South County, his house last week, and we were celebrating with Pastor Carlos from Hanley Road as he was sharing how a gentleman who grew up Jew, uh, became a devout Buddhist, um, was coming to church and had a girlfriend, and she said, look, we can't stay together if you don't know Jesus, but I'm not going to make that happen. So you, it's between you and Jesus. Now him, he said, I, I don't believe in this Jesus. I don't think he's going to do anything. And if it does, I'm good. So he comes to Pastor Carlos, and Pastor Carlos said, cool, just read these books, books in the Bible. Read Matthew. Just read about this Jesus. And before you know it, this devout Buddhist who was a Jew gives his heart to Jesus and reading the scripture because the living word breathed by the, by the living spirit birthed life of salvation. It doesn't change. It doesn't stop. And it can save you, whoever you are, wherever you're at. Come to him who died for you. If you hear the wooing, respond. It, it grows not just in salvation, but and what Christians call sanctification. It's a big word. All that means is spiritual growth. Being transformed into greater purity and then looking more and more and more like Jesus. And can I tell you, every Christian, there is an expectation that, that you, who has a living seed of the gospel in you, grows, that bears fruit in keeping with that faith and repentance. This is why we gather and preach and encourage you to study the word or gather in smaller communities like community groups so that you would grow. Please do not be satisfied with stagnant living for Jesus, casual living for Jesus. And let me warn you, you who think you're simply in neutral, you're not. It's either progressing or going back, but it's never stand still, never neutral, and never simply stagnant. The gospel grows. Grace is meant to be visible. It says Barnabas saw the grace of God on them. So whatever that next step is for you, take it. Be serious about it. Believe that God can grow you in whatever you're facing. Because even, even those who feel like, man, um, I'm stagnant, I'm neutral, and you need to be challenged. There's a number of you just simply need to be encouraged. Hi. What your eyes are on is how much you're not who you want to be and how you still get angry. And you're not the dad or the mom or the sister or the child or the student that, that you know God calls you to be. And may you be encouraged today. Like maybe... Your eyes shouldn't be so much on what you're not yet, but be reminded of you're not who you used to be. Like, the gospel is changing you. It's slow, it's messy, but it's still changing you because the local church grows. The local church doesn't simply grow in any kind of way, but grows in a very specific way. It grows in being centered on Jesus. The local church centers on Jesus. This is important. For the local church can center on a number of things, and many churches choose a number of things to be centered on. A church and its people have to fight hard to be centered on Jesus. They came proclaiming the Lord Jesus, and we knew they stayed faithful to that because at the end, it says, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Christians. They were associated. They had distinct lives that can only be explained by being associated with this Jesus Christ. They shared, in, they shared Christ. They grew in Christ. They identified with Christ. Their, their lives, their church was shaped and fueled by the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a distinction that, that comes about when you're centered on him. Centered on him and nothing else. 
that there's a contrast that happens from you and everything else. It should be, though. Like, if you don't, if you think not, it should be. There's a contrasting that happens. And sometimes we're just so uncomfortable with the contrast that we rather move away from the contrast and let me fight to, to remain cool with everybody else. Let me not be too contrasting or I'll be the weird ones. Now, hear me. Nobody wants to be the weird ones. But can I just tell you something? The moment your life bears the name of Jesus, you are a weird one. You can fight it hard against it all you want to. You are one already. And so many times we are so focused on not being those kind. Like for me, um, I got many categories that I've been critical over. And for me, I am one specific example. I am not a fan of Joy FM. Uh, please don't clap. Don't clap. Uh, I'm not a fan. And, and I used to judge anyone that listens to Joy FM. Now, my wife loves Joy FM. And, uh, and I used to be critical of her, too. Uh, and, and the Lord would just slowly humble me. You know how? Because every time I get in her minivan, there'll be, a, there'll be a song that comes on that would bring me to tears. And I'm like, why well, I got to like that song? <laughs> like I, and the Lord would just regularly teach me, hey, I'm forming people in Christ through that music that you don't like. You can be critical of that, but you're critical of that that's bearing fruit for my glory. So why don't you, put, why don't you not put so much energy and attention in who you don't want to be and put energy and attention on who you want to be, which is me, and become whatever I call you to become, even if it means you are the weird one, even if it means you're, you're not the cool one or accessible one. And can I tell you? Some of us are so, fighting so hard to, to not be too contrasting. And we think that will bear effectiveness in the world. But the, but the world needs Christ, not your coolness. The, the world needs you to be and mark the, by the name of Jesus, not you to be so cool that they can't tell the difference. We are centered on Jesus as individuals and collectively. We have to be a church that celebrates, looks to only Jesus, that the only name we're trying to make much of is his name and not ours. We cannot be a church that our celebration is who we are as the journey. Who cares about our name? There will come a point when this name goes away, but there'll be one name still exalted, Jesus Christ. And that's the name we got to fully lean in on, whatever that, that costs us or it calls of us. And we got to pray Encourage and celebrate any church centered on Jesus Christ. Even those that don't look like us, don't act like us, disagree with us with key things that we're passionately disagree. But if they're leaning into Jesus and wrestling with that, oh, they should get affirmation, celebration, and prayer from us. Because we are people, the local church centers on Jesus. We know this. One of the things that is about that you see when a life is centered and affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ, it, it becomes radically diverse. And we see the local church is one of those organiz- organisms or organizations that, that pursues diversity in the name of Jesus Christ. The lo- local church pursues. We see this in this movement, in this church, like something very unique happens here. Like if you look at chapter 13, and we're still talking about the same church, Antioch Church. And we'll see this list of names. Let me read them to you. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of, of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, if I just read it, all this to many of us is just a list of names. Make no bit of difference to us. But let me, let's just double click on it and see what comes up. So all of a sudden, we get a group of leaders, elders, mind you, sitting around a table, encouraging, praying, and loving one another. Now, this makes no sense out of sight of Jesus because you got Barnabas. Barnabas is a Levi. He's one kind of Jew. And he was part of the church way before in, any of these, even Saul. And you got Barnabas who was building up, encouraging the church while Saul was persecuting the church. In the early movement of the church, it wasn't that big. There's a high likelihood some of the people Saul in prison 
was Barnabas' people that he deeply loved. And all of a sudden, I got to love you who hurt the people I love. And if, and you, and if you're like me, you know this. There are a few things that make me more angry when you hurt the people I deeply love. And all of a sudden, Barnabas is loving, encouraging, and will go out with Saul. What does this, the gospel? Only the gospel. Without, the, without Jesus, they swinging on each other. I'm telling you they would. I'm swinging. But with Jesus, when our identities are shifted, like we don't lose our distinction, but it submits to who Jesus is, and we are first and foremost Christians before we're anything else, we see this in Barnabas and Saul. We see this in Lucius and Simeon, like Simeon. I love that it included this, uh, around the table is Simeon. And what does it say after Simeon, who was called Niger? You know what that means? The brother was black. That's what that means. Like he was a dark-skinned brother on the leadership team of Antioch with two different kinds of Jews. And Lucius, that, that, uh, that tradition says, was a white African. So we got a black African and a white African sitting at the same table. Differences coming together under one name. They're, they're diverse in ethnicity and race, but even in their backstory. Like we see the backstory of all these, but, but man, we, we got to lean into the backstory of Manan. Like Manan, and you would think, man, why you got to keep naming the description? I would think about Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod. Like this is what he's being reminded of. This is what we're being reminded of who he is. Here's what this means. Herod, um, one of the most evil, wicked men. And this is his lifelong friend. Like Herod was the one who asked his scandalous stepdaughter, what would you like? And she says, I desire the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod is the one that gave it to her. Herod is the one that was instrumental in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So this is Manan's homeboy. They, man, they rode bikes together. They played together. They played video games together. They, they shared stories with each other. And this is who's sitting at the table. Manan, who has such wicked associations in his backstory. But it's a steady reminder, regardless of the backstory you come to the gospel with, the gospel is big enough, strong enough, and more alive to cover anything you bring to it. Manan is a faithful example. If you think, if you think your background is wicked, dark, and he can't do nothing with you, you better circle Manan. Now that is a gift to you. He said, anybody with this backstory ought not be leading no church, but he's leading one of the most prolific churches in history because the church pursues diversity. Like if diversity is around the table, we can best believe diversity is in the church. And we know that because there was Jews and Greeks. And so I'm sure there's other blacks and black Africans and white Africans. I'm sure there's like people like Manan who were from the upper crust of society. Like I'm sure there are people that socioeconomic diversity throughout the church. Because there's something that happens when the gospel arrests your heart. You have eyes to see the beauty of all people. And you don't just see it, you pursue it. Like you pursue, I want more and more people coming and sitting around the, the, the table of the gospel with me that doesn't look anything like me. Like a leadership team in a church this diverse points to one thing, that the people of this church regularly left their comfort zones, entered into new contexts to share the gospel and disciple others. They brought these others back and developed such a gospel identity that showed a unity in the church that only makes sense in Jesus. My prayer is that that would be us. Like we have a level of diversity. We're not, we're not where we could be. And, and the reason why we would want it and pray for it and pursue it is because we give our lives fully to making much of Jesus. And it never will make sense to anyone on the outside why such different people hold hands, pray for and encourage one another. And that alone is a pointer to him. The local church pursues diversity. The local church, it doesn't just pursue diversity, but we see in verse 2, let me read, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, I have a lot of time on this, but the Holy Spirit, the local church worships, prays, 
and listens, worships, prays, and listens. They are a people enthralled with God, like overwhelmed with God, treasuring God, blessing God, singing to him, pursuing him, enjoying him. Like who they desire is him. And this is what this points to, a, a people who are not casual when they gather with the people of God, who are not casual with the privilege of, that the gospel gives them to, to see the face of the most treasured being in the world, Jesus Christ. And so these are people that sing and pray. Like, we bless you, God. We love you, God. We want more of you, God. We need you, God. We won't do anything that doesn't bring you glory. Show us. Would you manifest your presence so we are walking empowered by you? Uh, the local church is not one that enters into this space with, with a level of being casual. We should come with expectation, looking for God to show up in ways that we didn't experience outside of here. Now, God is always present. But he does seek to show up in special ways when his people come together. May we be a people that worships, prays, and listens, listens to the Holy Spirit. We know he listens because the Holy Spirit said, and what we'll see is they did. The local church, it worships, it prays, and it listens, but it listens for some specific things. Now, we know we listen for very personal things. Like many of us, when we pray, say, Lord, speak, bring clarity. It's all about... Not all, but mostly about our personal circumstances. Make it clear. Help us. Show us. Encourage us. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes I think we're missing. God is always writing a bigger story. That's why I showed you last week the, nar- the, the arc of the people of God from creation to full restoration. That he's always writing a bigger story than simply our day-to-day circumstances. And we're wanting to be a people who listens to how he's directing his bigger plan. So we see that he does that for them. Let's read. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid they led their hands on them and sent them off. Because the local church, it sends. It sends out. It sends out to move the gospel and God's bigger plan forward. Like the Antioch, they were, I mean, they were effective in sharing the gospel and with their neighbors in the neighborhood. And they heard the call that it should and it can't stop with us. It should go to the nations. And whatever it cost them, whatever it meant for them, they said, okay, we'll send to the nations. Now hear me, this, when we read the Bible, we gotta pause and enter in emotionally what this meant. Because we bring 11 and 13 together, what you see, Barnabas, he is the one called out to first affirm from the Jerusalem church the validity of the gospel in the Antioch church. Such an instrumental role. He stayed, encouraged them, loved them, walked with them, went to get Saul, came back, and they stayed with them for extended time, discipling them, building them up as individuals and the church, crying with them as they are wrestling with how to apply the gospel, sitting with them when their families reject them for the gospel they believe. Barnabas and Saul are no small things. They are the most eminent, gifted, and loving leaders of this church. And this, these are the people that God said go, and the church said we'll send. Because no matter what it means for us, God's mission matters more. They send their best. They send their most beloved. They send their best resources. They give their best time, but they send their best people. When you send your best, you feel it. Like, this is no small moment. Like, if, if you've ever been one sent or sending you, 
You feel it in the, de- the depths of your heart, and you're crying. Because you know, for some people, I may not ever see you again or serve with you again. Like, so I experienced this. Um, when I was a pastor of Journey Metro East, the lead pastor there, and was helping to send out people to plant a church in East St. Louis called City of Joy Fellowship. And I made a call to the church for everyone, from staff to every child, you sit in the pew, everyone is called to at least ask the Lord, are you sending me? Everyone at least ask. And so we put this vision out, and I cast a vision, I'm praying, and despite me praying and believing God for it, I was the first one hurting when people started saying, I'll go. Like my friend Brett Brian, who, man, we had walked through so much together. He helped interview me to bring me to the journey, and there are painful things we walk through together, encouraging one another, loving one another, and all of a sudden he wants to go with his family. And I'm facing the real fact that I won't see him, hang with him. I won't hear his sarcasm that I rarely understand, but, <laughs> but he's leaving and I love him though. And then there's a the family, the Quinleys, the family that comes to you, and the pastor knows this. If there are certain families God sends you, and you just feel like it's a blessing, it's an honor that I get to lead them. And they're the kind of people I want to grow old with, and I want to one day do their funerals. Because they're so special. And they love the Lord. And they came. And I thought we had years together, but they felt the call to go to East St. Louis and plant a church. And when they left, I felt it because John Quinley was the most consistent encourager and prayer partner I ever had regularly on his prayer journal. He reminds me, I'm praying for you. What else, what's new this week? I'm praying for you. And I look to grow old with him, to love him until his old age, and then one day possibly do his funeral. But that never happened because he passed away from cancer. And as I'm sitting in his funeral, reminded, when you sinned, it hurts. Or my friend Brett, who's married to a beautiful lady cat, missionaries in China, was coming off the mission field. And we, our, our dream was to do ministry together. Like some way, I wanted him on staff with me, and if not on staff, we'll figure it out, but we're going to do this thing together. We waited patiently for you to come off. And I put in my prayer journal, Lord, please. And you know, if you put it in your prayer journal, you, you mean it. <laughs> like, Lord, please make a way. Make, bring, bring a position, bring money. Just let us do it. And he comes off, and I'm excited. We're going, we'll figure it out. We are going to figure out how we get to do ministry together. And then uh, I sit with him one lunch, and we're talking, and we're talking about ministry, and talking about what he's looking to do in ministry, and, and his leadership abilities, and led worship, and different things. And it hits me that the day before that, a buddy of mine who planted a church sends out a message to a number of us and says, Hey, I'm looking for a worship leader, someone who can lead really well, even beyond worship leading. Hey, if you know anyone, would you send them my way? And I remember sitting there, the Lord said, that's Brett. Now, in the, immediately I said, no, it ain't. It ain't, it ain't him. It <laughs> is not him. It is somebody else named Brett. It is not him. And in a moment, I said, I'm not going to share this, because if I don't share this text, Brett will never know. So I was like, I'm good. I ain't, I ain't lying to the brother. He don't know. And the Lord said, You send your best, even if it hurts you. I remember in that moment, I knew I had to tell him, and I knew, regardless of what process, I knew Brett was going to go. And I will not get to do ministry with a brother I look forward to doing ministry with in a way I wanted to do ministry. And to this day, I still feel it. Because when you you sin, the church sends their best. There are a number of you. And I look at you, and I love you dearly, and I see how you serve this church. And if you leave, there will be a hole because you serve this church so faithfully, and how your, fa- your family serves, and you, you have relationships around. But can I tell you that if God says go, you got to go. You can't say but. But Jesus, but my friends, but I'm doing, but they need me. You can't. As your pastor, I release you to say, I'll go no matter what. 
Because the local church is the one that sends their best. Even if I'm sending you to a place that I may never see your face again until we see each other in heaven. And as hard as that is, I'm telling you, you got to go. Because the local church is one that sends. We are people who are called to live sent lives. When you're living here, you are always a sent people. You're sent to your neighbors, sent to your family, sent to your coworkers, sent to your neighborhoods. You are sent, sent to nations, whether full-time or short-term, but you're sent. But there are some of us, and I pray that it is some of us, there are some of us God will call for much more than that. He will say, it's time for you to move from West County to North City. It's time for you to leave St. Louis to East St. Louis. It's time for you to leave America to India. Japan. Like, it's time. And you got to go. Because the success of this church cannot be, it cannot be how many people we sit in these seats. It has to be how many people we send out for Christ. That's got to be our mark. Because the local church sends. The local church, this Beautiful, visible expression for the people of God. These marks of perseverance and singing and crowing and sending. We say, we say yes, even to hard places. These people that God calls the bride of Christ. What do we do with her? How do we respond to her? Well, first we love her. We love the bride of Christ. We love her dearly, for she is the bride of Christ. She is the one he died for. She is the one he, he places his affections on. So we love her. We have affections for her. We don't just go to church. We love the church. We get to be with the church. We be thankful for her. We say it for thank you for the church. Because no matter what day, no matter what you're going through, she's a gift from God to you. So we sacrifice for her. We give our full, full selves. We send our best for her. Oh, we hold on to her. We hold on to the bride. We hold on to the church. We hold on when she fails. We're faithful to her when she disappoints. And can I tell you, she will. She has. There's not going to be a day when you look at a local expression of church and they are perfectly all that God called them to be. They never will. But even on their worst day, when we're messy and petty and judgmental and hypocritical, when we don't do things we should, when we do things we should not do, do you realize something? God never forsakes his church. God never leaves the bride. God never says, I'm, I'm through with you. So we hold on to her. May we extend forgiveness when she hurts us. You know why? Because no matter what you think, she's God's plan A of taking the gospel to the world. She's not plan B, C, or Z. You're not going to find another group of people that have been entrusted with the, the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ, empowered by his spirit to take it forth. No other group does that. And no other group will spend eternity with you. So you might as well get rid of it. You might as well get used to us now. Like if you're messy and I'm messy, we're a match made in heaven. Let's do this thing together. Because we forgive. We extend grace. We have hope for her. Like, the church, this church, the bride, we have hope because there's not a day where the grace is not real, where the gospel isn't real. It's not a day where if you walk away, there's not a day Jesus will ever walk away from her. It's not a day where he'll pull his spirit from her. So because that's true, 
because his grace is true, because the gospel is true. You always have reason to have hope for her. The same way I have hope for you, no matter where you're at, no matter how messy or hypocritical you are. The gospel real is real for you and real for us. So we believe the best. Cynicism is not, does not find a place in the church. It can't. It is destructive and evil. Cynicism should not find a place in your heart for you, for anyone else. Cynicism. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place of healthy, honest conversation of the failures. There's always a place for that. But cynicism of being done with the church? No. we got to be done with that. For she is the bride of Christ. So we have hope for her. We find healing in her. Like if you're like me, you've experienced some things in church. Things that will probably cause tears anytime you think about it. There's always a sting when you think about that person and what they said and what they did. How they slandered you and betrayed you. I have them. And you know what I learned? And I hope we all learn. Like the same church, same bride that hurts you is the same way God will use to heal you. They are the ones with the words, the grace, the arms, the hugs, the sitting with you that God will use to heal you. And when you hear this whisper, be done with the church, you might think it's wisdom. Can I offer something? It could be a scheme of the enemy. Because the moment he creates that division, he is ripping you out of the one place you can find healing in. And if you're out there saying, I'm done with the church, you're in the middle of a scheme that is not for your good. There's no other place you will find the gospel. There's no other place you will find him manifesting himself like that. There's no other place he seeks to use to take the gospel forward. It's like when Jesus goes to Peter, will you leave? Peter says, where would I go? And the church, direct flow out of Jesus. Our response to the church is, where would I go? that has the people that God had died for, that he empowers and he gave the grace for. Because can I tell you, you'll never be who you're called to be without the local church. You'll never be who you're created to be without the local church. So my sons, no matter what mantra they repeat, they still fight, they knuckleheads. And I go to my boy, especially my oldest one, he's starting to understand things and I said, Hey, man, you can fight with him, with your little brother. But can I tell you, that's the only brother you have. Can I tell you, he's a gift to you, and God gave him to you, for you. And it will be through him that you become the best part of you, because you need him. Now, he's eight-year-old. He don't get it. <laughs> but y'all grown folks. Can I tell you, you can fight with her. You can walk away from her. You can be angry with her. But the church, she is what you need. She is what God gave you to love you, to comfort you, so that you persevere and end strong. So we only have one choice. Let's love and be the local church. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask that you would help us to be this, to do this, to live this. And we repent of cynicism and distrust And we ask for courage to lean in where we have been hurt, to trust where trust has been broken, but to believe the best for her, because she is your bride, Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for her and giving her to us. In Jesus' name, amen.